Good morning and welcome to the continuing Bible study in the book of Romans presented to you from the Central Church of Christ here in Martinsburg, West Virginia. We're so delighted that you've joined this uh, live stream study with us today. Appreciate you tuning in and I hope that this study will be a benefit to all of us. I know it's a benefit to me personally in preparing these lessons and I hope it is helpful to you as well. In our last uh, session, we had ended in Romans chapter 2, and we're going to begin reading uh, this morning at verse 12 in just a moment. Let me take just a moment and look at three questions or so on the study questions that uh, you should have received, and it, the paper looks like this. At the top, it says study questions Romans 2 and 3. We looked at the first four questions of those in our last uh, class. Uh, question four said, men will be judged according to their blank. And of course, the answer is their deeds or their works. We had turned over and looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, where Paul says that we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, and he talks about giving answer for the things done in the body according to what the man hath done, whether it be good or bad. So what we've done would refer to our deeds, our works. That will be uh, what we're judged according to or based upon there in answer to number four. That takes us down to question five, who is the real Jew? And the word real there is italicized to tell us that we're not talking now in literal terminology, not the uh, person who is Jewish by race, but what, what does Paul say really defines whether a person is a, quote, Jew in the sense that he is acceptable to God? It's no longer based upon race. If you turn in your Bible over to Galatians chapter 3 for a moment, this will serve as sort of an introduction to the, uh, the rest of today's lesson. Galatians chapter 3, uh, Paul is speaking about this same subject. And as I've said before, Galatians and Romans are very similar in a way. These two books should be studied together. Verse 16 of Galatians 3, he says, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet when it hath been confirmed, no one maketh it void or addeth thereto. Verse 16, now to Abraham were the promises spoken and to his seed. He saith not and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Now notice the argument that Paul is making. The seed of Abraham is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came or descended from uh, in the genealogy of Abraham. And Paul is making that point that salvation is uh, brought about for all through Jesus Christ, who is the seed of Abraham. All right, continuing there, he says, uh, verse 18, I'm sorry, verse 17, he says, Now this I say, a covenant confirmed beforehand by God, the law which came 430 years after, doth not disannul, so as to make the promise of none effect. That is, the coming of the law 400 years later didn't change that promise that had been made to Abraham. So the promise of salvation, of blessing through Abraham's seed, was in effect in place. That promise was in place before, long before Moses came along with the old law. Verse 18, for if the inheritance is of the law, it is no more of promise. All right. So today we receive these blessings through Christ, not because of some physical uh, descendancy or relationship, not because we are Jews or Gentiles, but because we are Christ's and that he is the seed through whom these blessings would come. Um, Dropping down to verse 23 in that chapter, he says, But before faith came, we were kept in ward under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Notice how Paul makes a contrast and uses the words faith versus law. 
not that there was no faith involved back under the Mosaic law, and not that there is no law involved today, but he uses these words to identify the two different dispensations of, of God's will and of God's grace. Verse 24, so that the law is become our tutor to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. So the Old Testament law was to bring us or lead us to Christ much like a tutor or maybe more literally, a school bus driver brings the student into a position of learning in the same way the old law brought people to Jesus Christ. But now he says, verse 25, that faith has come. We're no longer under a tutor. For ye are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 27, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ did put on Christ. There can be neither Jew nor Greek. There can be neither bond nor free, neither male nor female, for you're all one man in Christ Jesus. And if you're Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, heirs according to promise. So keep those verses in mind as we look down through this concept of who is the real Jew. Well, in the spiritual sense of the word, the, the chosen person of God today is the person who fears God and keeps his commandments. In whatever nation he may live in, uh, it is a matter of respecting God, honoring him, and simply obeying his word, regardless of what race a person may be. All right, back in Romans chapter 2 now, let's, let's begin reading at verse 12. I'm going to put these... Um, Verses on the screen, beginning at verse 12. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned under the law shall be judged by the law. Now stop for a moment. The word without there is sometimes used to mean outside of, <clears throat> okay? So if you are near a church building but standing without, that means you're standing outside of the building. When he says, for as many as have sinned without law, he's not saying there that they had no law. He's saying that they were outside of that particular law. When the Old Testament law, the law of Moses was given, it was given to the Israelite people. It was not given to the Gentiles. They were without that law. They were outside that law. But that doesn't mean that they had no law. They were still under the patriarchal law of God. They were still answerable to God. And that's what Paul had been discussing back in chapter 1. Now, please remember that in chapter 1, Paul proved, he showed clearly that Gentiles, without God, and without their obedience to God, are lost that Gentiles cannot be saved today apart from the gospel. And in chapter 2, he begins showing that the same is true of Jews. They cannot be saved without the gospel. All right? So back then, he's saying those who were without the law, he said that they shall perish without the law. If, if a person does not obey the law that they have access to or that they're under, they're going to perish, whether they be Jew or Gentile. And as many as have sinned under the law shall be judged by the law. All right? So you Jews pick up on this, Paul says. Back then, if a person was outside of the Mosaic law, they would perish outside of the Mosaic law. And as if they have sinned under the law, they'll be judged according to that law or under that law. Verse 13, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Note the distinction between simply hearing that Old Testament law versus doing it. And this started to get to the Jews, I'm sure, as they read these words, they were probably feeling the nudge in their own back, thinking, whoa, that's beginning to hurt. Because they knew the Jewish people at, at that time were notorious for not obeying their law. 
Remember, Jesus condemned them many times clearly that they, they were saying, they were preaching it, teaching it, but they weren't following it. They weren't practicing it. They were disobeying their own law. Verse 14, for when Gentiles that have not the law, that is, again, they're outside of the Mosaic law now. When these Gentiles that have not the law do by nature the things of the law, that is, they live moral lives, they, tr they try to be pleasing to God. Why? Because they see God in his creation. Remember back in chapter 1, uh, the, the invisible things him, of him since the creation are clearly seen, verse 20, Romans 1, 20. The Gentiles could see that, and some of them tried to be pleasing to God. They tried to obey God and to be moral and upright and godly in their living, even though they didn't have this Mosaic law. It's so near and dear to the Jewish heart. Paul says when Gentiles do that, when, when they live righteously in conformity with God's will, he says when they who, that have not the law do by nature the things of the law, these not having the law are the law unto themselves. It's as if they had it because they, they get it. And they are being pleasing to God by the way that they are living in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts. That is, they uh, are conscientiously striving to please God and obey him. Their work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness therewith, accusing or else excusing them. That is, they were try striving to have a good conscience, keep a good conscience, and to be pleasing to God. And when they do that, they were in essence a law unto themselves, acceptable to God because they were obeying the will of God even though they were outside of that Mosaic law. And they're going to stand in a good position in the day of judgment, he says. Look at verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men according to my gospel uh, by Jesus Christ. All right. Verse 17. But if thou bearest the name of a Jew... Now stop here for a moment and remember, we said that beginning in chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul was addressing the Jews... But he didn't say so at first. He didn't call them out. Now, as this argument proceeds, he makes it very, very clear, unmistakable, that he is talking about the Jewish people. And I'm sure his readers are picking up on that, and they're realizing, you know what? These Jewish readers are realizing he's talking to us. Verse 17, But if thou bearest the name of a Jew, and restest upon the law, and gloriest in God, that it resteth upon the law, that is, you, you rely upon that law, you, you think that that law is, is so great, and you pride yourself as a Jew because you have that law, and you glory in God, verse 18, and knowest his will and approvest the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them that are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, teacher of babes. You see, he's, he's calling out these Jewish religious people. They looked at themselves in this way. They thought of themselves as wise, instructors. We have the law. Never mind that they were not obeying it. They weren't practicing it personally, but they were certainly teaching it to others. Jesus called these type of people blind guides. He also said they were hypocrites. They would bind heavy burdens, grievous to be borne, Jesus says, but they themselves would not assist in lifting the burdens at all. They would bind them only upon others. So Paul says if, that's, if, if you're a Jew, these descriptions apply to you, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having in the law the form of knowledge and of the truth. All right? So they had the law of God, the Mosaic law, but he's saying they were not keeping it faithfully. They weren't practicing it. Verse 21, Thou therefore that teachest another, teachest not thy, thyself? 
teachest thou not thyself? Okay. Again, not practicing what they were preaching. They prided themselves in their knowledge, but knowing it is one thing and practicing doing it is another. Paul says, thou that preachest a man should not steal. Dost thou steal? There is a re another rhetorical question. These are questions whose answer is obvious. They're asked for the sake of emphasis. The answer is, uh, is obviously uh, that, no, no, you can't do that, but, but that's what they were doing. They were falling short of the law that they themselves were touting and teaching to others. Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou rob temples or commit sacrilege is the idea there? Uh, thou that gloriest in the law, through thy transgression of the law, dishonorest thou God? All right. The Jewish people, by and large, Paul says, were largely dishonoring God because they were claiming to have God's law, and yet by their lifestyle, they were dishonoring him. For the name of God is blasphemed among you, among the Gentiles because of you, even as it is written. Now that statement there in verse uh, 24 is a, a quotation apparently from Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 5, which, in, which talks about the uh, dishonoring of God by the nations, that is by the Gentiles, because of the conduct of the Jewish people, God's own people. So Paul is pointing that out, that, that that's the effect of what they were doing, uh, even as it is written. Verse 25, For circumcision indeed profiteth if thou be a doer of the law, but if thou be a transgressor of the law, thy circumcision is become uncircumcision. Okay, very important point there. Circumcision profiteth. Why? Under the law of Moses, circumcision was required as a token, as a sign, and it was a sign of relationship with God. Uh, it showed that a person was of God's chosen people. But if, but if a person were circumcised, and even if that was done just exactly right, and yet they were transgressing the law, Paul says it becomes uncircumcision. We see here that physical circumcision is not what matters in the argument of the Apostle Paul. Physical circumcision does not avail anything, spiritually speaking. It doesn't get us any closer to God, doesn't make us any more acceptable to God. These Jewish people who put such great reliance upon circumcision, oh, I've been circumcised, I must be fine, I'm okay. That's a very physical, uh, superficial way of looking at it. And yet, you know, there are still people, aren't there today, that look at religion that way? Oh, I go through this ritual, and I do this ritual, and I do this, therefore I'm okay with God. Very superficial way of looking at religion religion and about our relationship to God. Paul says, look, if you're transgressing the law, you're not keeping God's will, obeying his word, uh, you may as well be uncircumcised because your circumcision has become uncircumcision. And uh, that's the end there, verse uh, 25. Now, let's go to verse 26. If therefore the uncircumcision keep the ordinances of, ordinances of the law. Now again, the uncircumcision is a reference to whom? That's a reference to the Gentiles, the, 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 those who are not obligated under the law to be circumcised. They were sometimes referred to as the uncircumcision. But Paul says if, if these Gentiles keep the law, keep the ordinances of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be reckoned for circumcision? Reckoned by whom? By God. Shall not God look upon those people as acceptable, even though they're not circumcised? 
Why would he do that? Because they are keeping the ordinances of the law. They're obeying God. We learn from this that God is more interested in obedience, in respect, in self-sacrifice and obeying God. <clears throat> He's more interested in that than in the external forms. Now, that isn't to say that the externals are not important. Paul isn't saying that. The circumcision was required. But he's saying that those forms standing alone cannot save you. And there, I think, is an important lesson for us. The outward acts going through the motions, as we say, is important. But that alone does not save a person. God is interested in the heart. He wants us to keep his ordinances and not just go make a show of it going through the forms or the outward rituals. Verse 27, And shall not the uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee? The word judge there means condemn thee. These who are, that you're looking your, down your nose at, these Gentiles out there, these uncircumcised, if they are fulfilling the law and doing by nature the things that are right and pleasing to God, even though they're uncircumcised, won't that judge you or condemn you who with the letter and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? Okay. He's really putting it to the Jews here in the way that he's challenging the way that they had been thinking. The physical relationship is not enough. The circumcision is not enough. Having the law, being an expert in the law is not enough. It is a matter of the heart. It is a matter of obedience to God and keeping his ordinances, his will. Verse 28, for he is not a Jew. Now notice this verse. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly. This is one of those expressions that is stated in a sort of a code or a, a signaling format that shows that there is a message here uh, that's very, very important to pick up on. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but, look at the word but there in verse 29. This is one of those not but expressions. Again, we've seen this many, many times in the Bible. The meaning is he is not a Jew who is one outwardly only, the, the outward uh, manifestations alone do not make a person a Jew in the real sense, the spiritual sense, the important sense. Okay? Now we're seeing the answer to this question. Who is the real Jew? All right? Back over in Galatians chapter 3 for a moment. I want to pick up on another statement that's made here. If you look really at the entire chapter, you see lessons here that tie in with what we're studying here in Romans chapter 3. But I want you to notice, especially in Galatians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, he says, Oh foolish Galatians, who did bewitch you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was openly set forth, crucified? This only what I learned from you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Notice the distinction there. They were placing such importance on the old law, the law of Moses. They were going back under the Old Testament. Paul says that was foolish. And he asks them some pointed questions. Are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit? Are you now perfected in the flesh? Notice the distinction again between spirit and flesh. Spirit referring to the new law, flesh to the old. 
Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it is in vain? He therefore that supplieth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Again, the contrast. Old Testament versus new. Works of the law versus the faith or the gospel. And then he says, verse 6, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned unto him for righteousness. Notice, Abraham believed God, and God treated that as righteousness. Even though Abraham lived before the old law, the Mosaic law that they cherished so much. Know therefore that they that are of faith, the same are sons of Abraham. There's your real Jew. They that are of the faith, of the gospel, of this obedient belief in Jesus Christ. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So then they that are of faith are blessed with the faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it's written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all the things that are written in the book of the law to do them. You see, Paul's making the same point here as he made to the Romans. Those Jews who so greatly prided themselves were really, by their familiarity with the old law really were pronouncing a curse upon themselves because cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law. So you make one mistake, break one of the laws, and you're cursed under a system like that. And Paul says, Yet you place such great reliance upon the old law. How many of you are actually keeping it perfectly? Verse 11, Now that no man is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous shall live by faith. Again, he's contrasting the law, that is the Old Testament, with the faith, that is the New Testament. And the law is not of faith, but he that doeth them shall live in them. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it's written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that upon the Gentiles might come the blessing of Abraham in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. What promise? The promise that God made to Abraham that in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. I personally believe that that's what Peter was referring to there in Acts chapter 2 when he said, the promise is unto you and to your children and unto all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. What promise? The promise of salvation through Jesus Christ, that it would go sound forth from Jerusalem beginning there on the day of Pentecost, throughout the entire world. So, back in Romans chapter 2, verse 28, He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is uh, uh, outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Now notice, these are not but phrases. They should not be read to say that letters are not important at all. Circumcision is not important at all. Being a Jew is not important at all. He's not uh, saying it's either or. It's both and. He says, yes, being a Jew is, is a great blessing, but it must be coupled with obedience. Faith in God that is obedient in its nature. Yes, the letter of the law was important, but it must be coupled with the spirit of the law. Remember Jesus said to the Pharisees, you tithe mint and anise and cumin, but have forgotten or neglected 
the weightier matters of the law, faith, mercy, justice. These, he says, you ought to have done and, watch this now, and not to have left the other undone. Okay, he doesn't say that these physical things were unimportant. He says that they are not effective if that's all there is. They don't get you anywhere if you don't have the spiritual component to go along with them. Okay? It's a little bit like uh, buying a car that is just a shell, looks good on the outside, and everybody walks by and says, wow, how impressive that is. But without the internal mechanisms that make it run, the engine, the transmission or drivetrain, and the, the mechanical aspects of that car that actually produce a purpose, it's just an outward show without that. And so Paul is, similarly, he's saying that if, if you want to know who the real Jew is, you can't determine that by looking at the outward appearance. You've got to look at the heart. All right, so now Paul has, in chapter 1, he's shown the need that the Gentiles have for the gospel. But now we see, in chapter 2, he has shown uh, the need that the Jews have for the gospel as well. Now, he's going to continue that thought into chapter 3. So let's look at chapter 3, and uh, beginning at verse 1, just look at the first couple of verses there. What advantage, then, hath the Jew... Or what is the profit of circumcision? Now stop for a moment. What's he doing? He is anticipating an objection. Okay? He has laid out the position, but he's anticipating their objection. What's the objection? Well, then what good is it to have been a Jew, Paul? If what you're saying is true, and these outward forms are not uh, effective in and of themselves, then what good is it to be a Jew? <clears throat> Paul anticipates that objection. What advantage then hath the Jew? Or, or what is the profit of circumcision? Or watch the answer. Much. Much. Now this translation says, much every way. The idea there is much in many a way, many different ways. He's not saying that in every single way it is an advantage, but he is saying that there is an advantage in many a way, many different ways. And then he gives one, the greatest of them. He doesn't stop to explain any others. He says this is the main advantage, first of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. If you are listening to this broadcast today and you are of Jewish descent, of the Jewish race physically, and you're asking this question in your mind, well, then if I accept the gospel, that's saying that uh, really being a Jew, there's no advantage. Paul would say, oh, oh no, wait a minute. There was great honor, great benefit bestowed upon the Jewish race because they were the ones who were entrusted with God's special law. You know, there is no greater evidence of God's love for mankind than the fact that he gave his son, Jesus Christ, to die for all. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But there is no greater manifestation of God's love second to that than what he did for the Jewish people in giving his law under the Old Testament. Think of it. God called out a people from all of the peoples of the earth and he said, these are my people. I am going to bring about my plan through this people. 
And he recognized that as a group of people, a race through whom the seed would come, which is Christ. He gave them a special law, which if they had lived up to it, if they had practiced it, would have truly made them holy and special in God's sight. Now, of course, they didn't do that. They rejected God's law. They rejected his prophets. He sent his prophets to them multiple times. They rejected them. By and large, the Jewish people rejected God's law. They rejected his prophets. They rejected God. And that's what, one of the things that Paul has demonstrated in these, in these verses that we've studied. But still, Paul is saying there is a sense in which you can take pride in the fact that you are a Jew because it was the Jewish people to whom God entrusted his law. Now, that's not going to get you to heaven. <laughs> that's not going to save you because you, you didn't have any say in whether you were a Jew or a Gentile, right? F fella can't take any credit for being born. You were born a Jew, good for you. But guess what? That fact alone isn't going to save you any more than in any other race is going to save another man. But there was a, a sense in which God showed a special interest in the Jewish people. You should keep that in mind, Paul says. That's a, that is an advantage. That's an encouragement. That's an advantage that the Jew has, chapter 3 there in verse 1. All right? Continuing, chapter 3 and verse 3. For what if some were without faith? <clears throat> now let's stop. What's he doing? He's anticipating another objection. Another objection that some of Paul's readers would have had. Shall their want of faith make of none effect the faithfulness of God? All right. Here's their objection. It would run something like this. What if some rejected God, were outside of the faith, lived out apart from the law of God, didn't keep their end of the bargain, if you will, does that mean that God will not keep his end of the bargain? Are you saying, Paul, that by going astray and not obeying the law and keeping it properly, that God then would, would be free to just disregard his part of this covenant, this agreement? Notice Paul's answer in verse 4, God forbid. That is, May it never be. That's a, a, one word in the Greek, and it's a very strong word. It means uh, absolutely not. God forbid. And then he makes this state, statement, Yea, let God be found true, but every man a liar. In other words, even if all people rejected God, God is still going to be found true. For as it is written, that thou mightst be justified in thy words and mightst prevail when thou comest into judgment. This is a quotation from Psalms chapter 51. Remember the occasion there, Nathan the prophet had confronted David the king, told about a, a very immoral, ungodly man, and when David learned about the facts of the case, he became very angry. Who is this? And Nathan said, thou art the man. And David immediately goes into great sorrow and repentance and realizing the gravity of his sin, he composes the 51st Psalm. And this is a quotation from that where he's talking to God and he's, he's basically saying, I'm confessing my wrong, I'm acknowledging and repenting of my wickedness. Why? So that you, God, might be justified when you speak, that you might prevail when you come into judgment. When this matter is viewed in its properness, in its right light, you are going to be vindicated. Uh, David is fully and completely acknowledging his guilt. Well, that's the context of that, of that 51st Psalm, and that's the Psalm that's quoted here. So what, what the, what's Paul's point by quoting that? That God is going to be right. No matter what man does. 
even if every single Jew had violated the law utterly and just, just completely abandoned God and walked away and didn't even make an effort to, to follow him, guess what? God would still hold up his end of the commitment. God would still be God. So that particular objection really goes away. Now there's another objection here, and the last of these that Paul deals with, that is really kind of out there. You might think, well, who would, who would argue like that? But, but there must have been some who would, because Paul deals with it here. Verse 5, but if our unrighteousness commendeth the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who visiteth with wrath? I speak after the manner of men. Okay, stop now. That's their objection. Let's see if we can break that down a little bit. When you live in an unrighteous manner and God is forced to judge you and exercise what Paul calls his wrath, visiteth, visiteth with wrath, uh, does that mean then, he says, if our unrighteousness uh, brings that out in God, does that mean that uh, we somehow should just go ahead and do whatever we want, go ahead and just live uh, however we feel and completely ignore God? Because we certainly wouldn't want to cause God to do something wrong or cause God to do something immoral. So, uh, striving and failing, if that's going to bring about God's wrath and judgment, maybe we should just not even try. Now, that's kind of a silly argument, an objection. You might think, well, that nobody would say it. But apparently there were some who were reasoning that way, and so Paul deals with that. And, of course, he uses the same phrase, God forbid, absolutely not. For then, verse 6, how shall God judge the world? See, if that were the case, God couldn't couldn't even judge the world. But of course, you admit that he will judge the world. The Jews understood that. They taught and, pre and preached that. That is a concept that is taught in the old law repeatedly. So they would admit that God is going to judge the world. Now, they didn't like to think that he was going to judge them. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about the Gentiles now. But they would admit, yes, God is going to judge the world. He is going to visit with wrath. Paul says, guess what? If your contention, your argument has any merit, he couldn't do that. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? But watch verse 7. But if the truth of God through my lie, that is his preaching of the gospel, they were calling it a lie. It's not really a lie, of course, but he's following their argument here. He's using their reasoning if, uh, if the truth of God through my lie abounded unto his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not, as we're slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose condemnation is just. Let's just go ahead and live an evil life. That would be the result of your reasoning. That would be the conclusion. But, and there, I guess there were some might who were saying that Paul was preaching that way. Well, Paul says that uh, has no merit to it whatsoever. And their, their condemnation is just, those who are accusing Paul of that. So these kind of objections to Paul's argument that he's already set forth, he answers here one by one to remove all doubt that what he has been presenting is absolutely correct. And later on in this chapter, beginning at verse 9, working on down, he'll finish up these thoughts and come to a conclusion to the effect that all men have sinned. All people have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's really the bottom line for this kind of reasoning. And he's going to show, therefore, the great need for the gospel to, sa to save mankind. We'll stop there in our study. I want to thank you for, for uh, joining in with us and following along and invite you to uh, stay tuned, maybe back out of your browser and refresh and come back here in about 15 minutes. 
and uh, we will be having our morning worship together. Thanks for joining us. So until then, God bless you. Continue to study the great book of Romans.